Well, thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I've really enjoyed the, um, the discussions th this morning. And now I'd like to sort of just really share um, uh, some thoughts, really. Again, my background of a coastal engineer by training who sort of evolved and changed through his career. Um, and um, I'm going to sort of look at the issue of climate change probably through the resilience lens a little bit more than the, 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 than the sort of the uh, net zero and mitigation lens, because I thought that would be sort of more useful. And I suppose if we, um, oh, I've got it. if we go maybe straight away, I mean, today it was published that the February 2024 was the warmest February uh, in recent history, um, and it's the ninth month in a year we've had a record monthly high temperature. This is annual temperatures here showing exactly the same thing by Copernicus from 1940 up to, up to the present, seeing that really we're having this, this systematic warming trend, 2023 being dramatically warmer than any previous year, reflecting underlying global warming due to human enhancement of the greenhouse effect and El Nino. So there's a, climate, there's a climatic sort of variation there, and you do get these variations, but this underlying very strong trend of seeing a rise in temperature linked to our greenhouse gas emissions. So again, the greenhouse effect is a natural effect, so it, it's always worth remembering the greenhouse effect makes life possible. So it is a pretty important thing, um, and we should be thankful for it, but now we are enhancing it significantly, and that's that is the problem, and we've really got to try and get that back into balance. But there are other things that we're observing. This actually is, that was air temperature, the previous plot. This is sea temperature. And I found this, you know, with some of these, uh, I'm not so familiar to looking at these kinds of pictures, but the, um, but, you know, the dramatic rise. And so this is, again, a monthly plot. So you can see the seasonal cycle, the warmest, the ocean's warmest about this time of year, because the southern the southern hemisphere is in summer. Um, global, this is global information. But again, you're seeing warmer and warmer rising. And again, we're in uncharted territory with ocean temperature. That's back, uh, in, the, that's back in the middle of 2023, so it doesn't go all the way through. And then, something I work on a lot, sea level. Again, this is global sea level going back to 1880. And what you see here is a rising trend melting of uh, land-based ice um, uh, and um, also the thermal expansion of, 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 of seawater. And what you see is that actually there's a significant acceleration in um, that. So sea levels were rising about sort of two millimetres a year in the early part of the record. It's now more like three or four millimetres. So there's a very profound change. It may not sound very much. I mean, I think maybe a, a way of expressing sea levels is maybe go from millimetres per year to, um, to, to uh, centimetres per century. So that's essentially um, uh, 40 centimetres over a century. So that's, and, and it's accelerating. So I'm just saying, so, and there's no evidence at all that it's going to stop accelerating. So that's something that's, that's a, a big, big concern. I think it's always, when you think about these kinds of climate issues, it's always worth remembering, well, um, sea, mean sea level doesn't actually, um, cause problems directly. So let's actually go to one place. And here's Southampton. So I used to work at Southampton before I went to Norwich. And um, we did a lot of work looking at the sea level records of one particular place. So this is what you measure at the tide gauge at Southampton. An annual mean sea level. Every, there's a tide gauge, you take all the data, you take an average for the year, you have one number, and you can see it's rising. And it's it, it, um, this, is, this will include how much the land is rising and falling at this place as well, but it's pretty similar to the globe. And at Southampton, it's a 1.7 millimetres over since 1935 to 2019, 3.8 since 1991, so that same acceleration of sea level. But then, it's, when you have a real record, you can also unpick um, the highest sea level that happens every year. So this is the highest sea level from the record every year, so, and these are things that cause floods. So we're moving from the mean to something that's actually a problem for people. And you can see that there's a fluctuation from year to year with that, with that peak uh, extreme level. Uh, and that would be, and this would be the combination of a high tide and a storm, a storm surge. So you've got a component of the weather that's producing this and also an effect from the mean sea level. And what you can see is that actually the variability from year to year 
doesn't really it doesn't change much, which I think is an important point to note. I always like to look at data and see, well, what really is happening? So if we, and the trend actually is very, very similar to the mean trend of the, of, of the mean. So really, you could argue that what we're seeing here is really a rise of the same extremes on the, on the mean sea level. So if we take, take this event, this is the 10th of March, 2008. It was an extreme event. If that had happened back um, in 1935, it would have had made a much lower flood. So if you actually go to a real flood, so there's no railway here, if, um, I apologise, but these are just two, two towns um, on the north side of the Isle of Wight, cows in Yarmouth at high tide, and so you can see this is 2008, and that rise in sea level has con directly contributed to flooding here in that um, the water is about 10 or 15 centimetres deep. In fact, maybe... Without, if the water was lower, there might not even be a flood route into the high streets. And clearly, put, in, put, on 50, put on 50 centimetres of sea level rise, you know, you can sort of see, without flood defences, these places are uh, having particular problems. Also, they've been flooded very, very frequently. This happens now occasionally. The frequency also changes. So, just to try to go from the global to the... Um, now, what's that? that's looking... Everything I've shown you has happened. So then let's think a little bit about the future. And so this is um, looking at different emissions trajectories. So we have to, when we think about the future, it's the future emissions that really, um, uh, really drive um, what will happen in the future. I mean, we, what we've done already has a legacy, but then the future emissions. So they can be, we can, this is actually following the Paris Agreement and going down to 1.5. So actually by about 2060 in this particular pathway, you're having negative emissions. So the world is actually, the CO2 concentrations are falling. Equally, these are sort of the worst case, very extreme scenarios. And here we have the historical emissions. And where are we going? And I suppose I would probably disagree with we're actually at the five degree view, I think we're more heading off in this sort, of, this sort of trajectory here. So I think there is optimism that actually what we've done has meant we have reduced emissions compared to a, a, a virtual world that you know, we're, we're comparing with where we've done nothing. Um, but emissions are still rising. So I mean, so, so it, so, I mean it's, it's, not, it's not a good story. Um, but it's just to point out that we have shifted the dial a bit, and now we're expecting really the most likely place to be about three degrees of global warming, and that's taking on board all the commitments different countries have made. So they've got to deliver on those commitments. So that's a key. So remember that they've got to deliver because it's easy to say you're going to do something. I am sceptical to some of the commitments. So I'll be honest with you. But just as, so we have these different emissions. We feel this is where it's most likely, around SSP 4 and 6. Up here, unlikely. Now, things, obviously, what we want to do is push the emissions down to here, and that's what we've been talking about. Equally, the doomsday scenario, um, something like Donald Trump is re-elected. He's talking about drilling, drill, baby, drill, I think is one of his quotes. I mean, putting apart this, maybe pushing up. So there's a, there's a lot to fight for and play for um, in this but just to focus on, we, we would think that the SSP 4.6 is the most likely. And then you go in, and so what kinds of temperatures? Well, I've sort of shown you the temperatures already. So the projections, we have this wide range of possible projections. And we're expecting this is sort of where we're most likely to be going, somewhere around about the three degree mark. But this is always, can't just count this entirely. And we want to be pushing down to here. <coughs> Equally, sea level. It's got a... It's kind of a lot more inertia um, in sea level. This plot goes to 2150, so it goes. The other one went to 2100, so it's going more than 100 years um, into the future. And if again, if we sort of look at the um, look at the SSP six, it's around about. It's sort of talking about a meter as the median by 2150, so a little bit more than 100 years. But there's a huge amount of uncertainty, much actually much more than temperature. And so it's a, we call it, you know, it's, it's, a, um, it, it's a very, um, uh, it, it, it's a very uh, poorly constrained problem. And these dashed lines up here show where maybe very unlikely, but where sea level could go if we have major output from the, from the Antarctic ice sheet. So it's really, we're, 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 we're trying to make decisions 
um, when we have deep uncertainty about what will happen. And that, that's something to really sort of think about. Um, so, let's just move to the UK. That's global. And then, well, what do we expect to see in the UK? And we've, what are we pretty confident about? Well, we expect to see warmer, wetter winters and drier and hotter summers. So, that's, I think, you know, um, we've pretty much seen that. This, this, this year, this winter has really been the archetype uh, of that, at least for the winter. And then, you know, and that's obviously going to lead to the issue of more summer heat waves is of particular concern. I think also, as the world warms, the atmosphere supports more moisture, and, it, and then therefore it can be more intense precipitation. So it will, a bit like sea level rise, will also get more intense rainfall events. And without any sort of science, I just, I cycled my whole life, and you get wetter when it rains these days, I would say. So maybe that's not totally science, but... But more, and there's lots of more scientific evidence than that to support that. So more in, higher mean sea levels, I've already explained that in detail. Uh, and that is important, though, um, because it will, um, and it's particularly important for railway infrastructure on the open coast, because waves are depth limited around the UK. So if the waves don't change, they're breaking a long way offshore. If the sea rises, they're breaking more of the wave energy has been dissipated at the coast. And so you're having higher loads, more energy dissipated at your structure. So that, so wa waves will get, definitely get, well, waves are getting bigger, I should say. It's not, this, is, this is happening. And waves are getting bigger due to sea level rise, whatever happens to the waves off, 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 off the coast. Lower confidence, I think, changes to winds and storms. Often it's talked about like, oh, it's climate change. I think I'm a bit skeptical that we really know. I'm not, I can't say it isn't climate change. I can't say it is. It's lower confidence. And we certainly, we've always had weather, and that will continue. So I think in an expectation, we are going to see storms. We now name them. That probably makes them more, you know, they're certainly in the media, we're more aware of them. So, 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 so that will continue. But um, I think this thing about we're going to see bigger storms, in some ways, um, it, it, in some ways, with many of the changes, we don't, with, with more intense precipitation events, for example, we maybe don't need to see more intense storms to, uh, to um, make them bad. This is OpenClim. This was mentioned, and this was a project that uh, is funded to develop methods to, to support the climate change risk assessment type process, national assessments. We've had three of them. There's a fourth one coming up. They happen every five years, providing maps of different impacts that you can see. So you can actually see... The, the distribution of impacts, and you can see um, uh, differences between, say, the north, the south, the east, the west. And we got just just talk through heat stress. So a huge increase. This is for two degrees of temperature rise above 1850 to 1900. So that's that's what we're talking about. We've seen quite a bit of that temperature rise already. So we see a large expansion in the number of people dying from heat-related mortality, mainly in the south. But actually, you start to see people up in Scotland. Not, they're not large numbers, but before, if you went back to zero, there were, was hardly anybody up there dying. I'll hop over there. Biodiversity. We, we have most of your bad losses in the southeast. The places to conserve, to conserve are the west and the, the, um, and the north. Agriculture. This is winter wheat. What you see, maybe, hopefully you can see it, is a, the actual problems in the southeast with two degrees. And with four degrees, it gets marked. Scotland, it's a great place to be a wheat farmer. So you do get winners and losers, and that's, again, what, what we're trying to tease out. The two in the middle, though, probably are most, are most interest to this audience. So flooding. So this is, this is catchment-level flooding. So it's not talking about runoff due to a heavy rainfall downpour. It's talking about the catchment scale of flooding. And what you see is this is the 1% river flow. It's growing generally in the west, and it's actually, sometimes you're seeing it decline in the east. So there's, again, an east-west shift. The hydrology does seem to vary. Now, this doesn't fully, in my view, factor in the, the intensification of precipitation I mentioned. So, that, I mean, there, so there's more work to be done on that. But that's the regional pattern that emerges from our current sort of models. And then what struck me more than any of these results, really, because I, mean, I sort of know this, but at the same time when you see a map, was drought. It's pretty bad everywhere. And I think, I do feel we, probably people in general just don't appreciate the, pref and that's the 95% of river flow, so low, low flow. It's falling 
everywhere. It's falling more in the east, so again, that east-west split is, is there, but it's falling absolutely everywhere. And it brings home that really just two degrees of warming has very profound effects. So I think in terms of, you know, we, the wetter winters so we, and then the drying in the summers. So you've really got a much more accentuated climatic cycle. So I think that's problems for railway infrastructure as far, I mean, I'm not a railway engineer, but as far as I understand, that's not something you're going to welcome. Um, I think also it's important to think about weather forecasts because um, for many of the things that we're worried about, we we, I mean, it's quite, you know, I said the un low uncertainty around storms. Well, weather forecasts are steadily improving. I mean, you know, if you go back to 1953, there was a big storm surge on the east coast of the United, of the United Kingdom, and, um, or the whole southern North Sea, and 307 people died in England, about 20 in Scotland, 50 in Belgium, nearly 2,000 in the Netherlands, and there was no warning whatsoever Nobody even understood what the phenomenon was. So even though it started to get bad in certain places, they didn't really know to understand that they could actually have phoned on and warned the next people just empirically. Now we have, we have weather forecasts, we have sea height forecasts routinely. We just take them all for granted and use them operationally. Um, and, you know, basically forecasts have improved by a day every decade since the uh, mid-20th century. So that's, that's actually... Again, we often maybe forget this, but it really is quite a profound um, achievement. And, you know, we can, now you can have a forecast for a week ahead. They're talking about having a forecast a month ahead, um, maybe by 2050. Now, there are really fundamental physical constraints on weather forecasts. For, you know, basically, the models blow up. But I think, you know, this... I, th you know, I think this is a really, you know, and I think, you know, talking with you, hearing all the talks today, I mean, you're, you're all very well aware of this, but I just think it's really worth emphasising that, that it is actually something that's really innovating and improving and really helps with, the, with, with at least the day to, the adapting to the day-to-day -day of climate. That's, the, that's, that's, that, that's really the, the key point. And, for example, you know, when we were looking at Paris before uh, lunch, you know, that's going to depend on this type of information to be able to be effective. When we think about responding uh, to climate change, then, what are the sort of issues that one needs to think about? And, you know, I've heard all in, this morning, you're, you're, it's a lot of this thinking. I'm just, I'm almost telling you what you already know here, I think. Um, but, you know, there's the issue of are you dealing with something that's operational or are you dealing with something strategic and planning? You know, an operational weather forecast, strategic, maybe the renewal trying to upgrade infrastructure in the renewal cycle. What's the time scale of the decision? Um, that's really critical. Years, decades, maybe, even, maybe you're even thinking up to a century um, into the future. Certainly that's one of the reasons that sea level information 2150 is produced so that we have scenarios out that far. What's your risk tolerance? Some, you know, it's, it's not one size fits all. Some decisions, you can accept quite high levels of risk. Others, you can accept very low risk. And so you spend a lot more money, I think, when you get to those risk uh, intolerant solutions. Not in, not in railways, but obviously nuclear is the classic risk intolerant industry. Um, so, you know, and they, that, that, so they spend a huge amount of time thinking about climate, particularly as most of their nuclear power stations are on the coast on sea level rise. That's something the nuclear industry worry about a lot. And then I think... I made the point about the deep uncertainty of, particularly with sea level, but it's with all these problems, so the potential for adaptive approaches and learning. I mean, all um, responses, in a way, are part of a series of steps. If you just got to think far enough into the future and you're going to be doing it again. So what are the potential for um, learning and really maybe even breaking decisions down into smaller steps so that you can then revisit them. And again, it's, so it's just part of the process to think about it. And always recognising, whatever you do, it won't be you, but somebody else, you know, your, your, your children stroke grandchildren, in quotes, will be having to deal with that at some stage. So, you know, you, might, you can bequeath things in better states for them that, that, or, 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 or not, depending on the decisions that you make. And when we think about, you know, adaptation to climate change and how we deal about this, the kind of classical model... It, this is going back, this is getting, and clearly this isn't happening in, in, in this group today, but um, just it, it, how things were, were focused was climate scientists ran their models, 
and produced information and gave it to users. So it's a one-way, uh, not really necessarily understanding what the user actually wanted. And so, I mean, I think we spent a lot of you know, thinking about this, well, really, you want to have a co-production model. Now, maybe the first throw out of the climate scientist is that first arrow, but then, of course, users say, that's not what I want to know. Um, and, uh, you know, and then the climate modeler says, oh, you can't model that. Um, but, well, anyway, so there's a, there's a dialogue and there's a discussion. What's important? How are the decisions made? And so I think it's important that things, I say this is a decision-led problem. What you guys need is what you need to know. I mean, it doesn't matter what the climate scientists might want to produce. That's what, that should be the focus um, of the, the problem. And I think also not everybody needs to understand climate change. And I think the notion of knowledge brokers, people who sit in the middle, I mean, I'm probably a knowledge broker, uh, really, in many ways, um, but there's a lot of people who've developed, developed the knowledge and understand climate, and they understand users in a particular sphere to some degree, so they can therefore do a lot of the integration to really um, to lead to better outcomes and facilitate that exchange and that co-production. Wildcards. I mean, uh, it's always, uh, th th these always get raised, so I thought I'd bring one up. Um, and it often get questions about it anyway, so might as well talk about it. The Gulf Stream collapse, it's been in the news recently. And, uh, you know, that's basically um, collapse of the circulation in the Atlantic um, due to greater freshwater input. Basically, more rain, because it's going to rain more because it's warmer, and the ice melting from Greenland will actually make the North Atlantic so fresh that the water will not, when it, when it freezes, will not settle down to the bottoms of the oceans. And so that, that creates a circulation. That shuts off the Gulf Stream that basically shuts down. Uh, Bergen in winter is about 15 degrees colder than it is today. Um, not quite so cold. In, in, but it, so there's a big cooling. Just look across at Canada. Where are we in latitude in Canada? Labrador. I mean, are, are there large populations in Labrador? I mean, I've never been there. Um, but uh, no, I think is the answer. Um, so you get this abrupt regional cooling over Europe, especially in winter. And it's a big research topic. I mean, people in places like the Oceanography Centre in Southampton are doing lots of observations and modelling of this. Some people say it's going to happen. I think it's, it's still very, it's still something to worry about. I mean, it's still something that's been researched, but there is a geological analogue, so it's happened. Uh, thousands of years ago, the Younger Dryas, 800 years of, of, of shutdown occurred, and so our, our latitudes really became really, really cold, uh, and, for, and for a long time. I mean, what would this mean? Would the, for the railways, this wouldn't be good, but I guess it's not really very good for the whole of northern Europe, and maybe it's a more excess, well, you know, it's one of these issues that if it did happen, there'd be a large movement of people south, I would suppose. We always talk about migration north, don't we, with climate change? Well, maybe this would trigger um, a process that was the opposite uh, from, from northern Europe. Then something I think that is um, more immediate and, 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 and worth thinking about is rapid sea level rise due to, due to Antarctic ice sheet collapse. So I showed you this picture um, at the beginning, uh, er, earlier on, to 2150, sh showing those, um, those sort of uh, dashed lines, um, these lines out here, which are what unlikely to happen, but are, you know, can't be ruled out um, in terms of uh, sea level rise. What, you know, what, 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 what would one do about that? That's, you know, the, the Thames barrier has been thinking about high-end scenarios and, 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 and things like that. They're not designing anything for it, but they've just kind of done thought experiments. What if? Um, that's, 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 that's the, if you go to 2300, so this is far, far into the future, but uh, and you just look at two emission scenarios. One is the um, one is the following the Paris Agreement. One is the high emissions. Um, with the with the Paris Agreement, it's half to over three meters of sea level rise by 2300. And with high emissions, well, it could be up to 15. I mean, it's kind of again, it's a bit like the um, like the uh, um, uh, the uh, thermohaline, the, the Gulf Stream shutting down. Probably, it's a world you don't want to be really living in, um, but there's still a significant rise even if we um, stabilise climate because 
sea level has a very long time scale. The oceans are expanding because they're warming. That's, that goes on for thousands of years. The ice sheets take, keep on melting for quite a while. So sea level keeps on uh, rising. And that's shown here with some data produced by the, 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 the Met Office. And it shows the four capitals in the UK. Um, and the blue is the Paris Agreement. Red is the high scenario. The blue is sort of maybe where we're going with our current emissions, sort of the three degree sort of view of the world a little bit, but that's around there. But the key point is, it, it, it varies from place to place, because in Scotland the land's rising a little bit, so it dipped more than in, and in London the land's sinking a little bit, so there's differences around the UK, but everywhere is seeing an ongoing rise in sea level. So that's, again, back to this point that really, from a pragmatic, you know, you can, you can expect sea levels in the future to be higher. It's not, it's, not, it's not a question of will it rise, it's how fast will it rise. So that's something to think about, and that will keep on going. So that might lead to maybe some more radical, some radical decisions about certain routes and things, for example. So some sea level is locked in, there's a commitment to sea level rise, and there's a commitment to adapt to sea level rise. So, some simple conclusions, really. Uh, well, climate change has been observed. This is not theory. This is something, you know, you're, you're, you're living in that world. And that's temperature rise, sea level rise, etc. the factors I've talked about. Some features, though, do remain uncertain. Things like storminess, you know, how much that's going to change. We still will have storms. Uh, but I think there's certainly enough information available to inform adaptation. I've heard about that this morning. I mean, you've been talking a lot about adaptation, I think. But there's, there is, there's plenty, there's enough... Uh, enough information to, to, to make decisions and to make better decisions on these issues. And I think this point about how you use it and thinking about flexibility, multi-step approaches, learning, these are very attractive approaches. And um, again, I think it's happening anyway, but, but being explicit about that really, I think, can actually be very uh, uh, helpful, I think, in, in, in an overall this response, and recognising that we'll, we'll hopefully know more in, in, say, 20 or 30 years, and so if you can make a decision now for buy a bit of time, and then make a decision uh, a little, say, a few decades in the future, that would be a better decision than making a big decision today. Improving weather forecasts certainly facilitates responses to extremes, and so that's, that's an area which I think, you know, is, needs to be uh, acknowledged and is quite, quite important in a practical operational sense and I think sea level rise is a, is a, is a particular long-term threat as the steady ongoing rise is expected even, un, even under a stabilized future climate so it's something it's something that uh, is quite relevant obviously I mean when I when I was working at Southampton I think that we had a hundred sites I was told were on on the coast with, with railway sites along the coast so there's a number of places where this is going to be a significant issue thank you very much <laughs>